Welcome, Ryan. Uh, we just finished recording Ryan's lectures for his new course, Spiritual Cybernetics. Five hours of recording. I think overall we've been working on it for about eight hours. Ryan was recording, I was editing. And we've also just opened enrollment for this new course that Ryan has put together for us. If you know anyone, by the way, who's interested in uh, philosophy, technology, etc., share the link with them. We're doing this live stream very spontaneously. But before we begin, Ryan was kind enough to gift us two bottles of Bavarian uh, beer. I was about to say wine, <laughs> which, which is the wine of Bavaria, isn't it? But maybe you can say a bit on, on, these, on these beers. Yes, yeah, so these are both imported beers from Bavaria. One is a smoke beer, a Rauch beer from Bomberg which is famous for grilling the yeast that they ferment within the beer. And the other is a Dunkel beer, a dark beer from Rüdingen. And um, because I wasn't sure which we would prefer, I brought two choices. So uh, we're gonna open them and enjoy a great taste of um, the old country while we um, talk about German philosophy. <laughs> so I'm Bavarian, obviously, for anyone who didn't know. This is from Bamberg, which is where a place where Hegel was editor of whatever newspaper, before he became a uh, professor in Berlin. And he when, he, when he was there, when he lived there, he didn't really like his job, but he wrote to one of his friends saying, das Bier ist gut, the beer is good. So he decided to stay. So um, this is the first time I'm seeing it, actually. And as we were discussing person, earlier, this is yeah. very likely the exact beer that Hegel would have this, this, drink, this one, drink. Yeah. Yes, because it's, a, what is it, a 400-year-old beer? And presume, because it was from Bomberg and they would have had local beer, <laughs> he undoubtedly would have enjoyed this. And also, Hegel is the first philosopher that you were discussing in your course. Hmm. So maybe give us, give us an overview over the course and also what made you come up with the, with the theme. Oh, yes. So I had a long-standing interest in cybernetic theory as a way of thinking about the freedom of machines, how we use them and what they elicit from us in terms of our desires and our questions about our place within the world. However, I was concerned for a very long time that it was framed either as a question of engineering or in a way that was framed in a, in a purely imminent way that didn't allow for a kind of poetic and religious flights of fancy. So I began to study the origin of technology and the fundamental questions of machines and computers. And the more that I did so, the more that I realized that they, they were quite meaningless apart from the creative activity and you might say even the spirit by which we had designed and used them. And for this reason that they must be understood not merely materially, but also in a way that we can call spiritual. Uh, that is that they, they are the manifestation externally of our spirits and they, through their operations, they carry along that spiritual interest and that communication amongst themselves. So in any case, I've called the title of the course Spiritual Cybernetics as a way of distinguishing it from material cybernetics or in a way that uh, points as it were to a more felicitous and hopefully optimistic way of thinking about technology today. Excellent, here's yours. And maybe also run us through just some of the, the main thinkers uh, you'll be discussing. And if anyone who's interested, we actually already sent out uh, the invitation email to uh, the people who had signed up uh, before. So we already have a couple of enrollments. If you want to enroll, the link to do so is in, in the description of this video somewhere. I cannot actually access uh, the computer is too far away from me, so I can't click on anything. It would look awkward. So we'll just be talking and drinking. So tell us more. Who are we reading? Hegel, Heidegger? Yes, yeah, so we're focusing on five key thinkers and an additional five auxiliary thinkers, many of whom I've discussed in the lectures alongside the main thinkers. The main thinkers are Hegel, Heidegger, Baudrillard, Deleuze, and Stiegler. And the reason I chose them was that I believe, although they aren't always expressly technological in their orientation, so no one, for instance, would usually think of Hegel or, or Baudrillard or, 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 or Deleuze as yeah. technological writers. Nonetheless, they, they often reflect upon questions of technology in relation to more searching ways of questioning the fundamental nature of reality and the way that we come to know it and act upon it. So, cheers. Toast. Toast. <laughs> this is actually a mug from Munich. Oh, yes. So, proper beer mug. Um, excellent. So, who... I mean, obviously, we get all kinds of people in our courses. 
Uh, but who do you think would would be most um, likely to enroll or who would benefit the most from taking this course? Well, I think one first has to have an interest in philosophy and specifically modern philosophy, that is post-Kantian philosophy, yeah. uh, more in what you might call the continental tradition, more from a German even than a French perspective, but we do touch upon later French philosophy as well. Um, people who are interested in continental philosophy of technology, yeah. perhaps, I would like to say that everyone can take an interest in it, but yeah. the, the content is very, very demanding because we'll be focusing on very challenging writers like Hegel and Heidegger, not to mention Deleuze and Stiegler. But with that being said, I feel that it should be of something that addresses some of the contemporary challenges of the world and how we understand its future possibilities in a way that I hope will be of broad interest, both to people who are working in technology sectors as well as people who um, have a more specialized interest in the, the humanities and philosophy in general. Yeah, we always have a huge contingent from people who work in tech. So people either who are directly in Silicon Valley or adjacent to it. Um, we just, I, so I taught a course on Heidegger on technocracy about two years ago now already. Or was it last year? Maybe one and a half years ago, I forgot. But we just finished um, another course, which is the philosophy of the machine by oh, Sean yes. McFadden, hmm. where we read Husserl, uh, the European uh, crisis of, of European sciences, uh, Jung, Luhmann, also a bit of Heidegger, and I forgot the other Engels, uh, and also Deleuze. Mm. Uh, but this one, I think, is 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 unique because I was listening to your lectures today, obviously, because it also ties it all back. You tie it all back to Plato mm. and also the beginning of cybernetics in Plato. Maybe you can say something on that also. Uh, before you do that, I'd just like to point out the beers. It's very good, actually. This beer is very. Oh, unique. glad you're enjoying it. Uh, the the course is open for enrollment. The link to enroll is in the description of the video. Now there are three different um, study options. Let's say the first one is self study. So anyone who's, uh, if you're interested in you know taking the course but you don't have time for the seminars, that's really best for you. So you get access to five lectures by Ryan. They're exclusive, so they're always behind the paywall. It's lifetime access, as they call it. And also you get access to the excerpts that we read. And so the, 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 the second tier, the second option is the group seminars. That means Ryan is going to lead six seminars beginning the 23rd of July, it's a Sunday. So we're meeting always Sunday, 6 to 8 p.m. UK time, first time on the 20th of July. The last one is the 27th of August. And on the 27th of August, that's the pro seminar. That's actually a seminar where you can present your own talk. You'll find many examples of this here on my channel. So this will be made public for those of you who want to get published. It's a chance for you to write something and get feedback from, I can, I can say feedback here because it's cybernetics, uh, get feedback from Ryan, that's a cybernetic term, kids, uh, on, on how you've been doing. Ryan, by the way, just to introduce it, if you don't know, Ryan has a doctorate from theology, in theology from Cambridge, sorry, and he's now actually an assistant professor, I hope that's the correct title, of theology at the University of Austin that's just being founded. So mm. congratulations to that, by the way, also you should drink to that, cheers. Um, so Ryan is, no, by law, I have to drink. Um, so Ryan has been published widely. You can see on his Twitter, uh, he's given hundreds of talks literally <laughs> all across the world. Um, I was just in Cambridge for one of your, your events, the hyper digital designs uh, workshop that you organized with a couple of friends. Uh, so Ryan has been thinking about these uh, things for many, many years and has been writing on them in a variety of ways. Uh, plenty of work to uh, to follow up on uh, here by Ryan. Um, so hence, if you know, so the, the seminars will be, I think, very enlightening. By the way, if you have any questions, I should open the chat at least so I can see if you have any questions. Uh, so there are a few people here. Um, and th the third option, just to mention this briefly, is because we always... Uh, you know, we get people like playwrights or people who are in business, um, in tech, etc., who are working on another on on one of their own projects. But maybe you think that Ryan's expertise can help you. Then the, th the third option is really also the best for you, um, which includes, in addition to the six 
seminars, which are 12 hours plus, um, also six private tutorials with Brian. So that's it from that side, uh, on that side. Um, if you have any questions, let us know. I'll try and read them quite far uh, from me because I'm a bit blind. But if you have questions, let us know. We'll answer them at the end. We'll be here another 15 minutes or so. But Ryan, cybernetics. Oh, yes. So you mentioned on that Plato, the, the origin of cybernetics long precedes its 20th century formulation. So the term is often associated with a American mathematician and engineer named Norbert Wiener, who yeah. wrote a book on cybernetics that was published in the 1950s. And it's since become a booming industry, both in literature and in, and in research, both amongst information scientists and engineers. However, he deliberately borrowed a term from Greek philosophy that had been used in a variety of, of potent ways across the history of Western thought, and in particular had been used by Plato in a number of concentric metaphors. And one thing that I called attention to in my lectures today was that in Plato's retelling of the origin of technology, when the Titan Prometheus stole the gift, the fire of the gods to give the power of reason to humans to change the world by reshaping it for their own desires, the first way in which it was manifested was in the constitution of the city-state, that is in the political community that had to be administrated in advance in order to orchestrate all human labor to act technologically upon the world. And in this sense, the city becomes the microcosm of cybernetics, that is the, the steering of the ship of the state, like a captain of a ship would steer the rowers of a trireme. And in doing so, Plato had used this metaphor to characterize not only the city-state, but also ultimately the entire cosmos. In his dialogue, The Statesman, he refers again to what he calls the cosmic pilot, the cosmic cybernetic boy who yeah. steers the ship of the universe, just like, as it were, the statesman or the philosopher king steers the ship of the state. And in this way, he associates political wisdom and indeed also moral wisdom or prudence with cybernetic administration of our labor upon the world. So this draw, shows how cybernetics is much more ancient and more potent and carried along in concentric spheres of operations across nature and society than it had been simply constrained to computers and their information relays. Excellent. So here's a good question by Dali. She actually also uh, is joining us. So cheers, post. <laughs> I have to refill your uh, it didn't quite all fit. So she's asking, have you already done an outline of each lesson? We actually haven't. So there are five lessons. Um, first one on Hegel, second one on Heidegger and Jünger, third one on Baudrillard and McLuhan, fourth mm -hmm. one on Deleuze and Nick Land. Yes. Let's not forget. We're actually reading <laughs> Nick Land for the first time yes. now. Should be thrilling. I have his horrendous book here, which is unreadable. Thank Numina. And uh, so I haven't really read Nick Land. And also, final one is Stiegler. And we yes um, so you can give us an overview over what you're actually going to do specifically in each yes of course yes I hope to release the outlines yeah. and the overview later next week um, I could tell you a bit about it now so the reason I chose these things versus I thought that they each captured a viewpoint on the way that that people at different philosophical epochs have thought about about technology and about computers and what we can call cybernetics so Although it's not often recognized, I argued that in Romantic Idealism, in Kant and Hegel, and to a lesser extent in the, the Hegelian philosopher Ernst Kapp, that yeah. there was a acknowledgement of how, how finite mechanics can be assumed into an infinite reciprocating loop of mechanical operations or cybernetics, and that this was extended to the organ projection of the ways in which technology was manifest in society. Later on, I explored how in Heidegger and Jünger, there was not only a fundamental questioning from the question of being to the question of technology or the essence of technology as the source of the inframing of the world and the disclosure of its hidden powers and truth, but also a gargantuan contest between human subjective freedom and the titanic forces of the industrial state that waged across Europe during the first and second world wars and how the laborer has some crisis of decision in order to act upon and discover the source of freedom by which they can navigate these channels of technical possibility. Later in, in Baudrillard and in McLuhan, I found how this 
same question was explored through questions of the simulation or the theatrical representation of the world in a way that captured its material reality in a symbolic production of all of those forms of self-representation understanding in a way that could be conceived either as hyperreal, as exceeding reality, but framed by computational simulations, or as sacramental and yeah. open to mythic and revelatory interpretations. Um, do we have another question? Yeah, well, we, I think you can continue on on just the outline if you go to oh, Heidegger, etc., and then we go, we go to the next question, which is a good one. So stay stay with us. Oh, good. So um, the outline. lastly, we turned to to Deleuze, Gilles Deleuze, and Nick Land to explore the, the more, penultimately penultimately the, the great challenge of cyberneticism today. That is, if we have a kind of maybe ironic and felicitous representation of this theatrical sacramental quality. In, in McLuhan and Baudrillard, in Deleuze and in Nick Land, we see that there's a kind of fissuring and schizophrenia of our psychic and social landscapes by cybernetic capitalism that exceeds human capacity and accelerates beyond human control. And all of that threatens to undermine human freedom individually and collectively and render obsolete and even extinct the possibility of, of human life within the world in the future. Yeah. Um, and so in answer to that question, and, and as a source of discussion for us all, I recommended that we look to the contemporary writings of Bernard Stiegler and Young Chul Han. That's the final lecture. Yes, um, who have raised what I think are the more mythical and even religious questions of yeah. the origin of technology and the way that it becomes a kind of fundamental supplement to the possibility of thinking, more original perhaps than either the question of being or of writing, because we have to begin to use tools before we can begin to write and before we begin to think about the world of being. And then further how, even in doing so, we're engaged in a contest of, of attention that demands from us that either we relinquish ourselves to the machine or we find ways of escaping from it, find ways of aestheticism that can allow for us to control our own desires and find the sources of freedom within ourselves. So, one thing, by the way, um, that you always point out and that we discussed a couple of times is that the, the okay, I'll, I'll be a bit mean, the folly of the Deleuzians. Oh, yes. Is to, you wouldn't put it like this, it's me, uh, who, you know, is to assume a perfect imminence. And that this leads to either fantasies of exit or just this right out despair. And you have a different view. You go towards transcendence or the hyper yes. digital movement, etc., to see that we can actually transcend, move out of this um, sheer or a perfect imminence or a supposed absolute imminence. Yes, I've been very critical of the Deleuzians and also the influence of Gilles Deleuze on a rhetoric of the digital that's been called the post-digital. Yeah. And part of my, my skepticism of the Deleuzian project has been a critique of the tacit Spinozist assumptions yeah. that we can mm. capture, as it were, the flights of the virtual or all imagination, all poetic fancy within a frame that holds together an assemblage that, that remains connected by its negative unity or that is simply related to itself in virtue of the sequence of its, um, of its flights from one node of, of, of access to another that is in a rhizomatic totality that that doesn't admit any outside or doesn't admit any interior unity that um, would sustain it in everlastingly. So what I argue is that in many ways, this recapitulates not only the ancient Stoic conception of the world as framed by substance and imminent logos, but even before that to a, a sophistical conception of the world that's captured by nomos, mm. that is by law that's orchestrated in speech and ultimately the way in which we speak of as it were, the virtual flights that are always substantialized for themselves. And what I argue is that one needs a point of transcendence in order to sustain the world. That is the world wouldn't be a world unless there was a unity. And that unity has to be something that is both one and within the world that yeah. holds it together. Yeah. And, and so for this reason, even it's, um, as you say, it, it sort of, it, it, it re-inscribes the exteriority that it denies. Yes, it, it, it sort of it, yes. and it totalizes where supposedly there is no totality. Mm -hmm. So the rhizomatic itself becomes a, a totalitarian 
um, yes. system. Yes, so it's a, it's a sort of vain gesture of, <laughs> that <laughs> pretends to openness while at the same it's, time for closing it. The funny thing with, the, with Ryan always is that he says the harshest things in the politest manner, uh, which is great. So, by the way, um, so R Dali says, Ryan, you have a beautiful brain. <laughs> I agree. He is a beautiful mind. Uh, and um, I can... I, I'm, I continue to be amazed uh, just listening to him when we have dinner together and uh, meet up in places like Cambridge and the Oxford and Cambridge Club, of course, also. So you can also be in in Ryan's uh, um, company in a couple of weeks. So just to get to uh, Renaissance fairies or in brackets, demon owls uh, question, she says, or he, I'm sorry, I can't actually see. I'm just wondering if I'm in the States, how do class work with the time difference? Well, so good question. We're meeting online, obviously. So this is open to potentially everyone. We, we're currently running a course with John Verveke. We have actually people joining in from India and from Australia. So it's 3 a.m. in the morning for them. Maybe that's not for you. But we are meeting at 6 p.m. UK time, 6 to 8 p.m. UK which is in the States, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and I think 10 a.m. to noon Pacific Standard Time, if I get my uh, American time zones right at the moment. That's in Central Europe, that would be 7 to 9 p.m. So I think it's a good time. That's been working now for the past four years pretty well so that we can cover at least the Western Hemisphere quite well so we can get people from South Africa joining in, but also almost everyone... Uh, who wants to join in from, from Northern America and even, I think, uh, South America to a certain degree, it would be possible. Um, so, yeah, so that I think should should be possible for you if you have time on a Sunday afternoon. If you are, um, you know, if you're working full time, that gives you the entire Saturday to prepare. You can listen to Ryan's lecture maybe a couple of times during the week. There's an audio file. There's a a video that you can just listen to. There's a very good app that comes with uh, Teachable. That's a platform that we use that works really well on, on the iPhone. I think it also works well on Android. Um, that lets you um, listen to the lecture during the week and then do some of the reading on the weekend and then come join the class. How, so the way this works is that so we meet at 6 p.m., let's say 1 p.m. for people in America, Eastern Standard Time, Ryan leads the seminars. You come in, Ryan gives you a brief overview over what um, this week is about. It's 10 minutes maybe or so. And after that, you get split up into breakout sessions. So you are going uh, to be discussing with your peers what the, you know, Ryan is free to do however he, he pleases to do this. But so basically what I do is people do it differently. <laughs> Philip does it a different way and, and Sean does it a different way. Um, <clears throat> so 15, 20 minutes long, you get a question. Maybe you get a precision that you have to argue for, however people do it. So you will split you up in a group of three to four people. So you get to meet the others. You also get access to the uh, to our Halkion Guild forum. So you can stay in touch with people there and maybe join one of the reading groups that are going at the moment. There's a reading group on Heidegger's Being in Time also that's currently meeting, I think, on Mondays. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, but so, and once we're done with the breakout sessions, you come back and then there's a group discussion, which again, Ryan leads. So let's say we're about 20 to 30 people or so in the group. Um, you get to ask Ryan questions. You have a discussion with the others again. And as we're moving through the, uh, the different thinkers, I think a certain you know, understanding of what, um, spiritual cybernetics could mean because ultimately the question for Ryan is if I, if I may speak for you and you please correct me is how can we remain free and human throughout this current I think how did you put it in the first lecture I think you said this is the most significant incision or uh, uh, technological development ever mm -hmm. digital is more significant maybe than fire even but <laughs> mm. well, it shows us the what fire could have been if it was constantly um if it, if it constantly accelerated through all of its computational capacities, that is, it um, in a way um, the the what is communicated within and beyond computers through the grammar of the digital 
is a kind of fire that's manifested through electricity and that electrifies the way in which we think and respond to our technological world. Yeah. But in a, in a way, what we so by the way, if anyone's interested in enrolling, the link to enroll is in the description of uh, the video. Also, all seminar dates are on there. Um, and so, you know, if you can't make one of the seminars, that's not an issue because we record the seminars. And that means you can just listen back. You can send Ryan um, emails with questions on the reading. And Ryan is very diligent. <laughs> He'll respond. He'll probably send you half a book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, usually, that's what happens. Um, so, if you miss out on one session, it's not, it's not a big uh, problem, uh, really. Uh, but if you really can't make any of the sessions or not enough of them, but you're still interested in the course, you can still enroll and take the uh, opt for the self-study uh, tier, which means no live seminars, but access to the recordings of the lectures and access to the recordings of the seminars. So if there are more questions for Ryan, it, it doesn't need to be on the course specifically. It can be on Hegel or Nick Land or Baudrillard, we're reading Baudrillard, um, or uh, Stiegler, etc. Let us know now. Uh, if not, there was something else I wanted to mention. Now it, it eludes me, of course. So maybe Ryan, back to you. But you asked about the, yeah. the, the sort of pivotal significance of, yeah. of cybernetics in the digital. And yeah. I do think that although you might say the more generic transition to technological society had occurred in what people called the agriculture revolution, when we first learned as were sow seeds and gather food surpluses and build cities, nonetheless, in a more specific and perhaps even more pregnant sense, we are entering into a new era that is unprecedented in the history of human thought and which will have lasting ramifications for millennia yet to come until, as it were, we conceive of a new way of communicating that is more, more expressed than, than um, digital computation, which um, is yet to be conceived. So I think that um, understanding cyberneticism, cybernetics, and the way in which we can respond to it with the freedom of our spirit is a question of urgent human concern and one that will be of, of great and lasting value for the future destiny of humanity. And although it's just the two of us here uh, enjoying beers in Brighton. I feel that um, <laughs> this is a topic that can electrify the interest of a wider audience and hopefully will have lasting significance on your lives. Yeah, I think it will. Um, I mean, I, we, uh, Ryan and I actually met on Twitter, <laughs> funnily enough. Uh, and we may not have met. We may have met because we, we we move in the similar circles, let's say, but we may have met, but maybe in a different way. And also what we're trying to do um, at Halkin is to use the, the technologies given to us in a way that it elevates and enhances life and also our intellectual, spiritual life and being. And I think this is what, especially this course will probably as uh, exemplify in terms of its contents, even more than any other course we've been offering so far, to be honest. So that's great. I so. <laughs> yes, I'm looking forward to it. Because I had the great pleasure today of, um, well, listening, so I was, because I was editing his lectures, I had the great pleasure of listening to these world-class lectures this afternoon. Um, and you can have the pleasure of that also, but you have to enroll. So if there are no more questions, which I don't think there are, and if you have anything else to say, you, you may. Oh, just one last thing. Yeah. I recognize that the authors will be reading are very, very challenging. And I, I fully appreciate that. And I'm sure you will find that as well. And also that perhaps the content that I've been describing may seem very complex and very um, elaborate. But nonetheless, I assure you that if you enroll in the course and if we discuss it together, we can draw out the significance of these ideas and we can help our, each other to understand them. So I, I hope that you'll um, rest assured that um, difficulties are surmountable, that humans have thought these ideas before and can think them again. And there's no, <laughs> there's no ultimate obstacle to thinking and, of what machines mean for us. Yes, and also what, you know, just to mention this, because you say this now, we, what we've been teaching now for the past four years is 
I'll just mention the thinkers is the Heideggers, pre Socratics. Uh, next year will be a great uh, Greek year, by the way. So next year will be Plato and Aristotle, lots of courses on Plato and Aristotle. I'm also trying to get people to teach actually ancient Greek. Uh, so I'm working on that also. I'll actually be in Athens very soon to record the courses for next year. Um, and, but so Heidegger, Hegel, we, we've got Philip Nicholas teaching a masterclass on Hegel. We, Philip taught a course on the phenomenology of spirit last year. I taught uh, Heidegger's Being in Time, uh, a seminar this year on Baudrillard. So we just finished a course, as I mentioned before, on Engels, Deleuze, Husserl, etc. Right now, going through with um, with uh, John Merveke, we're going through Tillich, Stanley Rosen, uh, DC Schindler, and Nishitani. We yeah. had uh, Daniel Zaruba teach a course on Nishitani two or three years ago. Um, so we've been, and Nietzsche was one another course, and German Idealism, I forgot German Idealism. Mm. Um, and and we, we've never uh, we've never dumped it down. Um, we're always doing, as a friend of mine, Mahmoud, uh, put it recently, we were always doing hardcore philosophy here. But you'd be surprised how many people will actually, um, who maybe if they completely are, have never read anything uh, like that before, or always maybe wanted to read in a significant way these texts, then become ardent readers of these texts and also understand them and actually also start to write. So we just publish, if you go on, org and click on yearbook, you can find collected essays by Tonatio Maron Gomez from Mexico City, um, who's, so he's been writing for the past two or three years on forgetting and memory, and also on cybernetics, by the way, in that regard. So Tonatio uh, has a, a great mind also. So he's been a, a student and a participant. We just published his stuff. Um, so this, this is what I'd like to see, is that there are people who come in who have been reading, like Tonatiu, uh, but then maybe do it in a more systematic way. And also, as you meet the others, you actually, um, I think, have more of a, an incentive to, to read what it is that you really always wanted to read. And in this case, it's not just about reading, it's about trying to understand our time. We are at the very beginning of something quite radically new, we are basically the first children of this, you know, just think back the past decade was the decade of social media. Mm. I didn't know social media until 2010 or so, but it's when I think back now, how much it's structured all of my life, G going to university, um, meeting friends, staying in touch with friends all across the world, how that was made not possible, but how that was facilitated or, or organized through social media is quite uh, significant. And now I'm basically building my entire life <laughs> on, um, on different social media platforms. I'm using them to build, of course, the, 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 the great idea, which is the Halcyon Academy. But yeah, so that's, that's just my uh, two or three cents, perhaps. So if there are any, not any more questions, let, let's just do this, because there's always a bit of a delay. Let us know if you have another question for Ryan. If not, then we'll go. Ryan, you can uh, uh, wish them farewell now. Um, but there's more people. There's always people coming in, coming out. So maybe, so if you have questions, let us know. If not, we'll just leave in a couple of seconds. Oh, well, thank you so much for your interest. I hope you'll consider joining our course. We have quite a lot of thrilling authors to read. We'll be diving deep into some of the greatest questions of the relation between man and the machine, the future of our technological society, and what recent developments in cybernetic theory portend for the future of humanity. I think that although the text will be challenging and the discussion will be rich, I hope that you'll find it as rewarding as it has been fruitful for me and for Johannes, and that um, much awaits for us to discover, and the wonder of the world is yet to come. Excellent, but that's a good way to end it, isn't it? Okay. So the wonder of the world is yet to come. On that jolly note, we shall take dinner. So the link to enroll, if you're seeing this afterwards, is in the description of this video. If you have any questions, leave a comment. I'll respond. Uh, you can find Ryan on Twitter if you want to see some of his uh, other work. 
And we hope to see you at the first seminar, which will be on the 23rd of July. That's a Sunday, 6 to 8 p.m. UK, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Good night.